meltdown. Part four of our investigation of the orgy of greed and recklessness that drove the world into financial collapse. Only now are the hard questions being asked. Only now are the key players being held to account. In this hour, after the fall, the sheikh who pretends the crash never happened. Dubai, in many ways, was a, a state pyramid scheme, a state Ponzi. The Wall Street king charged with fraud. Sounds to me a little bit like selling a car with faulty brakes and then buying an insurance policy on the buyer of those cars. The congresswoman who wants to jail the bankers. You can go after their seven homes, their yachts. And the world leaders who want a rethinking of capitalism. We are going to be in a mess that's going to make today look like a picnic. Meltdown, the secret history of the global financial collapse. The search for the causes of the global financial meltdown has led to some evidence of fraud and corruption. In the city, the financial district of London, England, during the boom, the wild partying and flaunted excess of the banking world became legendary. Then a deep throat appeared, someone who was telling tales out of school that could get everyone in trouble. City Boy was an anonymous column that appeared in a small local newspaper and soon attracted a wide following. Eventually, City Boy was revealed to be the 35-year-old, extremely successful investment banker, Garrett Anderson. I would focus on false rumors, I'd focus on uh, drugs and uh, strip joints, sexism, racism. I would tend to focus on the less salubrious sides of the city because I wanted people... To, well, I suppose those are the things that were causing me stress and grief and making me feel rather dubious about my job and so I, I wanted to just relieve really go into the confessional and, and tell everyone about it. City Boy's revelations included what he saw as widespread immoral and even criminal behavior in London's financial world. He says traders would regularly conspire to circulate false rumors about a company in order to drive its stock price up or down depending on the bets they had placed. He says that every day traders were feeding each other inside information that would allow them to illegally profit from deals. And that mentality was all pervasive. Inside of trading, the spreading of false rumors was becoming more and more prevalent. It was basically a genuinely a Wild West casino. It was a get rich quick. The good times are going to stop rolling at any minute. We've got to make our money. And I found it quite disgusting in, it, in a way. I had a very religious background. My, my, grandparents were missionaries, my father was a labour MP, um, I was a hippie. What the hell was I doing in this world? The low-level fraud revealed in Britain was nothing compared to the behaviour discovered at senior corporate levels in America. U.S. investigators, however, discovered that criminal behavior is hard to prove when it involves some of the most powerful people on Wall Street. The first two U.S. executives charged with fraud were Ralph Chiaffi and Matthew Tannen, who ran a giant hedge fund in America's fifth largest investment bank, Bear Stearns. They were among the top golden boys on Wall Street. But the failure of their investment fund in 2007 eventually led to the collapse of the bank. Investors lost billions. Investigators discovered that in March 2007, the two realized that their fund was melting down. Chiaffi emailed Tannen. The worry for me is that the subprime losses will be far worse than anything people have modeled. Meanwhile, Tannen bragged that he was still finding suckers to invest in a fund he knew was failing. Believe it or not, I've been able to convince people to add more money. They reminded me of the emails that we saw during the tech stock bubble where the analyst would go out and shill for some stock and then in an email tell his colleagues, this is crap. I think it's appalling that people who are making that much money and who are purport to be smarter than everybody else basically turn out to be nothing more than devious snake oil salesmen. 
At their trial, Chiaffi and Tannen hired a parade of high-powered expert witnesses to testify that their actions were not illegal. Just one of those experts, R. Glenn Hubbard, a former economic advisor to George W. Bush, was paid $100,000 for his testimony. The two were found not guilty, although they now face a raft of civil charges from the Security and Exchange Commission. The case was seen as a shocking demonstration of the power of Wall Street money. If we have a Wall Street bank that can afford a very, very clever litigators that have an awful lot of firepower behind them, uh, they can overwhelm the Securities and Exchange Commission, they can overwhelm other government agencies, they probably will. But that doesn't mean that they were playing the game straight. That doesn't mean that they were following the intention of the law. In recent months, a lot of investigators in the United States have focused on the richest investment bank, Goldman Sachs. The meeting of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission will come to order. In the hearings of the Congressional Commission examining the meltdown, Chairman Phil Angelides went after Goldman CEO Lloyd Blankfein for betting against his own customers in the market for complicated financial products. Do you believe that was a proper legal ethical practice? The short answer is, this is the practice of a market maker and I would like to explain this. Blankfein claimed that his bank was just putting together deals, matching buyers who believed house prices were going up with sellers who believed house prices would go down. He argued it was completely normal for Goldman to take one side of that bet or lend money to the buyer or the seller. We provide the necessary liquidity as market makers to help ensure that buyers and sellers can complete their transactions and securities markets can function efficiently. Goldman Sachs was not merely matching buyers to sellers. They were actively creating products for sale into the marketplace with the Goldman Sachs imprimatur behind it. And I believe that carries with it responsibility. Lloyd Blankfein denied that responsibility. He said betting against his own clients was okay because all parties knew what they were getting into. I'm just going to be blunt with you. It sounds to me a little bit like selling a car with faulty brakes and then buying an insurance policy on the buyer of those cars. Every I'm talking about betting of an asset security. here is an institution, okay. probably professional only investors dedicated in most cases to this business representing pension funds who have the life savings of police officers these teachers. are the professional investors who want this exposure but that was immediately contradicted by evidence unwittingly provided by a young goldman trader named fabrice tour A U.S. Senate committee discovered emails in which Mr. Tour had bragged that he was selling to unsophisticated investors, or as he called them, widows and orphans that I ran into at the airport. Goldman Sachs has claimed that it had no idea that the U.S. housing market was destined to collapse. But way back in January 2007, Fab Tour wrote, The whole building is about to collapse any time now. Only potential survivor, the fabulous Fab standing in the middle of these complex, highly leveraged, exotic trades he created. Fabrice Tour and Goldman Sachs were charged with fraud by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. I deny categorically the SEC's allegations, and I will defend myself in court against this false claim. Got it? 105? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Senate Investigations Committee Chairman Carl Levin went after Tour's superiors at Goldman Sachs, reading other emails which indicated they knew they were selling faulty products to their own clients. June 22 is the date of this email. Boy, that Timberwolf was one shitty deal. How much of that shitty deal did you sell to your clients after June 22, 2007? Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know the answer to that, but the price would have reflected levels that they wanted to invest oh of course they, but they don't know what's this you didn't tell them you thought it was a shitty deal well i, I didn't say that come on mr sparks well, mr Chairman. should goldman sachs be trying to sell and by the way it sold it a lot of it after that date should goldman sachs be trying to sell a shitty deal well 
Can you answer yeah, that one? Can words. you answer that one, yes or no? I mean, we expect, I think, when we go into the hardware store or when we go into the toy store for our children that when we buy products, that they're good products and that the people selling them stand behind them. It's really the nature of responsibility in a society and an economy. Goldman Sachs eventually settled its fraud case by paying an unprecedented $550 million fine. But several members of the U.S. Congress sent this letter to the Department of Justice, officially requesting a criminal investigation of Goldman and its senior executives. One of the reasons I'm interested in criminal proceedings is because you can go after their bank accounts. You can actually pry open, claw open their accounts, their personal accounts, their seven homes, their limousines, their yachts. You can go after, I'm looking for justice for the American people and how we're going to get the money back that our people are owed. Only two days after Goldman Sachs was charged with fraud, Chairman Lloyd Blankfein authorized a $5.5 billion package of new bonuses for his executives. That was somewhat galling to members of Congress who had seen the company benefit to the tune of several hundred billion dollars from the U.S. government bailout. Goldman Sachs was not a normal bank. It was a speculator in the market. How would it be if you went to Las Vegas and you gambled all your money away? And then at the very end you said, oh my goodness, my bad behavior should be rewarded, right? And you get the government of the United States to pay for your losses uh, in Las Vegas. That's a great deal. That's what he did. And they not only took their losses and gave them to someone else, they paid themselves bonuses for doing it. The search for fraud and corruption behind the meltdown was also underway in Europe, where some high-level con artists are going right back to business. In the boom years, Spain was widely referred to as the miracle of Europe. There were more houses built here than France, Germany, and several other European countries combined. But now we know there was a great deal of greed and corruption beneath the surface. Among the brightest stars of the real estate boom here was Francisco Hernando, a true Spanish success story. He lived a flamboyant lifestyle, surrounded by his motorcycle racing team, his corporate jets, and his private yacht. Not just any yacht, but at 236 feet long, costing $80 million, the biggest, most expensive yacht in Spain. In 2004, Francisco Hernando built what was supposed to be his crowning glory, near the town of Cesena, one hour south of Madrid, a giant condominium development the size of a small city. There were 89 buildings containing 13,000 apartments. The project was approved in record time. His town would bear his personal imprint, a community garden named after his wife, Maria Odena. And near the entrance, a 20-foot statue of his parents. At the gala unveiling of the project, Hernando was treated like a rock star by the Spanish media. Then a young reporter started to examine the story more closely. Everyone was saying, wow, that's great, that's wonderful, he's a self-made man. The problem is, when you dig deeper into the story, you discover that the project was approved in record time with no provision for things like water, roads, health facilities, all things that should be provided for families living there. It wasn't normal to see it approved with all these shortcomings. Alejandro Ramon soon discovered that the Sesenia project had been arranged with massive bribes to the mayor of the nearby town. The mayor was arrested. Journalists investigating Francisco Hernando's previous projects found a similar trail of corruption and bribery. 
He did not welcome this new brand of media attention. Today, Hernando's showcase development of Sesenia is a ghost town. Without all the proper hookups for water and sewage, very few people could actually move in. There is just one empty building after another, connected by deserted streets. Because of the meltdown, the market for condominiums has collapsed. Francisco Hernando has evaded prosecution because Spanish police have not yet been able to prove that he was the source of all the bribes. In a fit of pique, he announced that he's taking his business out of Spain and moving to Equatorial Guinea, where he is already involved in another scandal. We've seen this guy do the same thing over and over now in different countries. I don't know if this guy knows how to do it any other way. Maybe that's just how he does things. Over the last two years, criminal investigations in Spain have resulted in dozens of arrests. In the city of Marbella, almost the entire town council stands accused of accepting bribes from real estate developers. Because of the meltdown, two-thirds of Spanish municipalities are now facing bankruptcy. The crash has been even more spectacular in a bigger real estate boomtown. In the years before the meltdown, Dubai had the biggest real estate bonanza in the world. Then the market here tumbled, losing 50% of its value, leaving Dubai virtually insolvent. You would think that would upset Dubai's supreme leader, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, but apparently not. In January 2010, Sheikh Mohammed threw this massive party to mark the opening of the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa. Sheikh Mohammed calls himself Dubai's CEO. He always claimed that he ran his government according to strict business principles, but now many are quietly questioning his judgment and his leadership. Well, I think when you portray yourself as the CEO of Dubai Inc., uh, if a company goes bust and disgraces itself and, and leaves a lot of people indebted, normally in order any restructuring, the CEO has to, be, uh, has to be replaced. The problem in a traditional monarchy or an autocracy in this case is that the CEO remains. Government and business officials in Dubai have followed the Sheikh's lead. At the top of the Burj Tower on the day it opened. I'm excited that uh, all of you are uh, the first group of people to actually come uh, to the Burj at the top. Dubai's leading developer tried to portray the Dubai real estate crash as a good thing. Maybe values are changing, and that's good because the city at one point got to be too expensive. So I think that's good for the customers and that's good for the city. Moving through Dubai, you encounter a lot of evidence that things are not quite as rosy as the leadership pretends. This brand new $8 billion transit system was built by Japanese companies, but now the Dubai government can't pay for it. The Japanese are being offered a few cents on the dollar over a period of many years. Before the crash, Dubai was home to the world's greatest collection of building cranes. But now the construction sites have ground to a virtual halt. Many of these real estate developments have been spurred on by speculators who never intended to occupy the units, only to flip them for a profit. The government here did everything to encourage the scheme. To many critics, that was fraud. Dubai, in many ways, uh, with, with not to be too uncharitable, was uh, was a state uh, a state pyramid scheme, a state Ponzi. It relied on more people coming in to buy the properties or even the deposits of people who were who been there a little bit earlier than them, and it had to keep on going. The 
crash when it happened in Dubai was like a game of musical chairs coming to an end. The fools who were left with these half-finished properties, or in some cases patches of sand, were unable to sell on the premium because they were worthless by this stage. In the ultimate denial of reality, Dubai is moving right into its next real estate mega-project called The World. It is a series of islands off the coast, roughly in the shape of a world map. Developers are supposed to buy the islands and build their own tourist facilities on them. Austrian Joseph Kleindienst has bought the islands of Central Europe. The first island to be developed will be Germany. Joseph believes passionately in this project. His dream here includes hotels and condominiums to be used year-round by German tourists. Why would those tourists come here when the temperature in Dubai reaches 40 degrees Celsius, which it does for months at a time? Easy. Joseph says he's going to air-condition entire streets. The R&D Institute from Germany, the Fraunhofer Institute, came up with a excellent idea to help during this time. We will build a 1.6 kilometer long boulevard, climate controlled, so that people can walk outside 12 months a year and enjoy, enjoy the climate controlled boulevard. Joseph's optimism seems hard to justify. The parent company of the World Project has announced that it cannot pay its debts to its many creditors. The international skepticism about Dubai is only growing especially because the government here has been very secretive and even disingenuous about the state of its finances. Dubai's proposed island paradise with air-conditioned streets may be a harder sell than they imagine. I believe there were even plans to have refrigerated beaches in Dubai at one point, and I'm not sure in the post-credit crunch world that the smart money will be going to Dubai in quite that way anymore. Transparency, due diligence and sustainability will be the watchwords of the next decade and Dubai fails on all counts. I wouldn't feel particularly confident if I'd invested dozens of millions of dollars in purchasing these patches of sand. While Sheikh Mohammed tries to pretend that the meltdown never happened, other world leaders are trying to get to the root of the problem. There have been some very tough questions, including one from an unexpected source. Queen Elizabeth has lived through the Great Depression, World War, and numerous financial collapses, but she found the 2008 meltdown especially troubling. A few weeks after the crash, she decided to make her first ever visit to the London School of Economics. For a few minutes, she made polite conversation with her hosts and then surprised them with a tough question about the financial crisis. If they were all so smart, why did nobody notice it coming? The staff at the LSE were somewhat flummoxed by the question and eventually wrote to the Queen that it was a failure of imagination. Martin Wolf of the Financial Times of London, considered one of the foremost economic minds in Britain, has a more intriguing answer. You will never foresee these things because the system is ultimately just too complicated for anybody really to understand. The economy is an extremely complex uh, adaptive system. And in fact, I think it is the most complex system we know. It has the complexity of billions of people engaged producing billions of products over time and space and they are people and because they're people they are subject to all the emotions of human beings both euphoria and panic and all the rest of it collectively and individually such a system will generate very complicated phenomena and uh, it will often be very very difficult to interpret them the United States government is also searching for what went wrong. There is general agreement that it was a major failure of the U.S. regulatory system, starting with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC was asleep at the switch. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, for much of the time, was asleep at the switch. The Treasury, for much of the time, was asleep 
at the switch. But the drowsiness was all induced by this very, very powerful opiate called market fundamentalism. The idea that markets were basically perfect. They could do no wrong, that investors were smart, that smart investors would make all the inquiries they needed to make, that information was relatively and, rev and, 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 and easily available to everyone, uh, that therefore there could not be any problem. In Britain, the government regulator is the Financial Services Authority, which didn't do much better. They seemed easily foiled by legions of avaricious young smart elves. Basically, the attitude to politicians and regulators is hands off, we'll do our own thing, and of course what we're trying to say there is let us abuse a system that is open to abuse so we can make vast amounts of money and um, please don't hassle us. The interesting thing is that when the good times are rolling, we say, hands off, don't regulate us, stop having any involvement with us. And then as soon as we get in trouble, we come cap in hand and saying, actually, can you um, sort us out? So it's a, te it's a heads I win, tails you lose. Or as, as many people in, in Britain have said, we privatise the profits of the banks to a select few idiots like me, and we nationalise the losses to everyone, the idiots out there, <laughs> the civilians. <laughs> French Finance Minister Christine Lagarde is playing a key role in the search for effective new financial regulations. You hear privately from businessmen a lot. Governments can pass any regulation they want. We will always be able to outsmart governments and politicians in particular. Thieves and cops. Oui, c'est ça. C'est le gendarme et le voleur. Euh... C'est dans la nature humaine euh, que d'essayer de contourner les obstacles. Quand on est un petit enfant et qu'on vous donne un interdit, vous essayez de voir comment vous pouvez passer à travers. Là, c'est la même chose. Le gouvernement fixe des règles et le monde des affaires se dit, bon, voilà les règles, et voilà, il faudrait que je paye beaucoup de conseillers, de fiscalistes, d'avocats, de management, en consultant, etc. De, pour, pour, pour contourner les obstacles. Il faut constamment être en... Outsmarting each other. Donc il faut, il faut constamment euh, anticiper la manière dont l'autre va essayer de contourner la règle pour améliorer la règle. Donc on est en travail permanent. In the United States, the quest for new financial regulations has been swayed by the deep pockets of Wall Street bankers. There was real anger at the banks after the meltdown and widespread demand to hold Wall Street accountable. We know the financial industry is spending $1.4 million a day right here on K Street to kill legislation up on Capitol Hill. Consider this. On Capitol Hill, Wall Street lobbyists outnumber elected politicians five to one. The politicians are surrounded and outgunned. Somehow, though, Wall Street claims that it lost out in the financial reform package eventually signed into law by Barack Obama. I would be very skeptical of all Wall Street claims that they failed in terms of this new financial package. Certainly, they have an interest in making the public feel that they failed. And certainly members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, have an interest in making the public feel that they were very tough on Wall Street. That certainly is the rhetoric. But look carefully under the surface. Look at these 1,500 pages. Look at how many loopholes are still there. Wall Street came out exceedingly well. They lost the rhetorical contest. They won the regulatory contest. The search for new international financial regulation is proving equally difficult. It has been led by Dominic Strauss-Kahn at the International Monetary Fund. He was a longtime French finance minister and is considered a leading candidate to be the next president of France. The crisis also shows that some very risky behavior in the financial sector may put at risk the whole system. 
and uh, of course it's in the nature of the banking system to take risks that's why we have a banking system that's fine but there's a limit to the kind of risk that uh, you may take and if uh, you make a profit it's an individual profit and if you have a loss it's a collective loss so putting in place different kind of regulation that avoid or that limit this uh, appetite for risk is also part of what has to be done and uh, if we don't do anything of this then of course we means that we didn't learn, learn anything from the crisis and I can't imagine it will be a, the right attitude The failure to agree on new international financial rules will allow big banks to play one country off another to see where they can find the most lax regulation. Many believe the competition between New York and London to be the financial capital of the world was a major contributing factor to the 2008 meltdown. Now the real problem that we face going ahead is that this same kind of pressure where is going to be the financial capital of the world is going uh, to come back once the crisis memories of the crisis have faded um, certainly Frankfurt and Paris are going to be back into the race but so are Tokyo so is Singapore and so is Shanghai and so is Hong Kong and what I think may well happen at some point is if Shanghai and Hong Kong combine then you are really going to see a race to where's going to be the financial capital and unless we have some kind of global oversight it is going to be regulatory arbitrage it is going to be a race to the bottom most of the G20 country Dominic Strauss-Kahn believes that a repeat of the 2008 global financial collapse is inevitable I won't say it can't happen again it will happen again when I don't know two years five years ten years twenty years but there's no reason to believe that we have the silver bullet that make it possible to avoid any kind of crisis in, in, uh, in the global economy. The question is to try to first prevent, avoid as much as possible, and when we are able to uh, avoid the crisis, to have uh, tools to mitigate the effect of the crisis. While politicians argued over regulations which might prevent the next global crisis, Along came an explosion which made everyone think it was already here. In the spring of 2010, it looked as if the next global financial crisis was already starting. The government of Greece had sunk dangerously into debt and would no longer be able to pay its creditors. Demonstrations filled the streets of Athens as millions lost pay and benefits. Many international investors believe that if Greece fell, other countries such as Portugal, Spain, Italy and Ireland would not be far behind. All those countries found it very hard to borrow money. Why should I lend any money to you unless I trust that you're going to pay me back? And if you show that you are not reliable, I'm not going to trust you, or I'm going to demand huge interest rates in terms of making my next loan to you. Sovereigns are no different from banks, no different from individuals. So we've got to restore trust. Trust was supposed to be restored in Greece and other weak European countries with a one trillion dollar bailout funded by the strongest European powers and the International Monetary Fund. So we should Dominic Strauss-Kahn worries that the bailout is only a temporary solution to Europe's problems. The problem of Europe is a bigger problem than the Greek crisis. The problem of Europe is a problem of low growth. The problem of Europe is the fact that there's almost no increase in productivity 
and that uh, this uh, huge uh, set of countries accounting for close to one third of the global GDP is just unable to, in the recovery, to take advantage of the recovery. So far, the recovery in most parts of the world has been funded by massive government spending. This was the way to quickly create jobs in everything from construction to engineering and thus alleviate the unemployment crisis. Now, a lot of people would say, you're just putting off the pain for a later date, and indeed we are. What we're doing is those governments are taking on debt to do that, and it's our children and grandchildren who presumably will eventually have to repay that debt in order to, uh, to finance our little rescue today, which might not work and might only put things, uh, put a day of reckoning off for another couple of years. For some leaders, such as Nicolas Sarkozy of France, the global financial crisis has been a profound shock that radically transformed their view of the world. Sarkozy has always been seen as a right-wing free enterpriser, very much pro-capitalist and pro-American. Then France was rocked by plant closures and labor upheavals. Some workers even kidnapped their bosses and turned to other forms of violence. Il nous faut trouver. In September 2008, Sarkozy gave a speech that astonished his audience. Le laisser faire, c'est fini. Le marché tout puissant qui a toujours raison, c'est fini. Je vous l'ai dit, je crois qu'on a tous changé au travers de cette crise. Et... En même temps que, que, que la bulle immobilière et que la bulle financière s'est dégonflée, euh, ça nous a tous permis de faire un peu un examen de, de conscience, euh, de la création de valeur, euh, de la répartition des, des ressources, de l'allocation des richesses, euh, de la stratégie des pays les uns à l'égard des autres, de la mesure du bien-être. Je crois que sur tous ces points-là, nous avons tous évolué, le président de la République aussi. Ce sont des principes sains sur lesquels je ne céderai pas. President Sarkozy has asked some of the world's leading economists to come up with new ways of measuring growth and prosperity, to give greater consideration to the environment and quality of life. He wants a rethinking of capitalism. What gets measured gets done. Si vous n'êtes pas capable de mesurer quelque chose, Vous ne faites rien, vous n'améliorez rien, puisque vous ne savez pas par rapport à quoi vous vous basez. Donc la, la mesure des choses est extrêmement importante. Je vous donne un, un exemple. Si vous pensez que l'eau n'a aucun prix, vous laissez couler tous vos robinets, ça n'a pas de prix. Et pourtant, ça a un coût. Vous consommez de l'eau. Donc il faut, pour chaque chose, pouvoir fournir une valeur, pouvoir fixer un prix. While many Western nations are rethinking capitalism, China is embracing it with a fervor that could prove dangerous. The Chinese economy has been surging ahead in the last few years. And many economists seem to believe that China can become a kind of engine that pulls the world out of recession. Chinese consumers are becoming richer, and there is hope that their increased spending will kickstart the global economy. On the other hand, there is widespread concern that the next real estate bubble that will lead to the next global meltdown is already inflating here. In the world's largest municipality, Chongqing, you see the construction of an endless supply of apartments right beside other apartment buildings that are largely unoccupied. It seems eerily familiar from the real estate bubble which preceded the 2008 meltdown in Dubai and elsewhere. The Chinese Communist Party, however, tends to conceal any unpleasant facts about the economy here. 
Professor Michael Pettis teaches in the business school at Beijing University. He says China watchers have to resort to odd measures to try to get at the truth about the real estate bubble. A friend of mine in Shanghai came up with a very interesting indirect way of measuring inventory in, in Shanghai. You know, a couple months ago we had an eclipse of the sun at 10 o'clock in the morning in China time, and it was a total eclipse in, in Shanghai. So his reasoning was at 10 o'clock in the morning you're supposed to be at work, so all the office lights should be on. And he just rode around the city checking out the office lights. And he said that he, you know, it's not a very scientific measure, but it led him to feel that there was an awful lot of empty office uh, space. Now there has been a more scientific study in which electricity consumption was closely measured in new office buildings and condominiums. The study confirms an enormous glut of unused office space and estimates that there are 65 million empty apartments in China, all evidence of a very dangerous real estate bubble. In the next few years, China and India are expected to take over some of the top spots among the world's leading economies, which only increases the worry about financial meltdowns starting there. If we're affected by a slowdown in the United States, if we're affected by a slowdown in Europe, what's going to happen when the two economies, two and a half billion people, China and India, when there's a slowdown there? What's going to happen when a hedge fund fails in India? What's going to happen when there's a mortgage meltdown in China? The effect on the rest of us is going to be enormous. And the time to deal with those kinds of issues is now, before in fact it happens. Because if we don't ensure that Chinese banks are transparent, if we don't ensure that the Indian financial industry has a set of regulations that, that at least live to a minimal stand, world standard, then we are going to be in a mess that's going to make today look like a picnic. In the last two years, Canadians learned about the power and unpredictability of a financial crisis. Canada has had only a small taste of the wrenching protests and disruption that became the hallmark of the financial collapse around the world. This was the first truly global economic meltdown where the interconnectedness of the world economy exploded in ways that very few bankers and economists had foreseen. And very few politicians knew how to deal with. History has taught world leaders that major economic crises like the Great Depression go on for years. Just when you think it's over, along comes another relapse. Even though the causes of the 2008 meltdown are now clear, there is no magic formula to stop it from happening again. The world has to start planning for the next crisis, even as we recognize that this one is not over yet. In two weeks on Doxo, they are unique in every way. Conjoined sisters in BC have challenged the medical world and society at large. Everybody's going to see them as freaks. They're special little girls and we love them. Incredibly, they seem to share each other's senses. They can definitely see and feel what each other's doing. Fascinating is an understatement. Twins who share a brain. Next time on Doxum.